Hello, uh, Bibbo. Um, what is it? It was founded in 1964, so it's been going over 50 years, and the aims have always stayed very within a word or two of the same. So it's the conservation, restoration, study, selection, and improvement of the native and near native honeybees of Britain and Ireland. Well, we probably haven't got native in um, uh, the south of England, but we've probably got something that we can uh, classify as uh, near native. We talk about it as, as the day goes on. Um, this event is um, the first uh, of nine that we're running regionally um, between uh, today and the end of March. And uh, I have to tell you, that, um, a couple of days ago we broke through the thousand booking uh, barrier. So um, uh, they're obviously very popular as we can see by the um, crowd here today. Now we rely on uh, individuals or beekeeping associations to do the host and do the local uh, work, book the hall and that sort of thing. And uh, today I'm very pleased to um, uh, say that um, this one is hosted by the Midway uh, Beekeepers Association. Now those of you who know me will know that um, uh, uh, I think beekeeping should be fun. Somebody said on one occasion after I was made uh, redundant twice in five months, don't worry about Roger Patterson, he'll laugh his way through life. So I want to share with you one of the biggest jokes in beekeeping. <laughs> I thought you'd recognise that, but seriously, um, uh, Bob phoned me up not that long ago actually, just before Christmas I think, and said, look, I'm in Kent, um, uh, I can't really get across to the closest one in West Sussex. He said, the nearest one to me is uh, Suffolk, um, up near, I think, Bury St Edmunds. So some distance, he said, can you run one in Kent? So we had a bit of a chat about it, and I can tell you, then, within about 24 hours, we had it set up. And ever since then, Bob has done all, well, not all, but a lot of the groundwork, the legwork, to uh, put this on today. So that's the man that needs thank you. So you thank him. <laughs> Um, incidentally, the West Sussex one, which Bob, Bob was going to go to, which was for the South East, that's fairly close to being sold out as well. Um, we've got Carl Collier at the back. He's um, come down, I think, on a motorbike. Did you come on a motorbike? Not today, no, no. No, not today. He's come all the way from Cheshire just to see you folks. So what a reputation we got in the South East. Um, he's got the bit of a stand um, uh, out there. If you want to go and uh, have a chat with him or whatever um, during the breaks, please, please do so. We've also got um, Sandra Gray, the uh, MBUB inspector, with a, d a display down at the back end. If you don't know your regional bee inspector, uh, go and have a chat with, um, uh, with Sandra. Um, what she's got on is a little special offer just for the day. If you can identify an Asian hornet, should actually give you a ten-pound note. <laughs> okay, you all right, Sandra? We've also. <laughs> I keep telling you, beekeeping's fun. Um, we've also got a central association of beekeepers. Um, a little stand up in the corner, which I think uh, Bob's running. All these things are beneficial in some way to uh, beekeeping. So please, uh, please support them. Visit them during the breaks. A little bit about today. It's really to encourage beekeepers and beekeeping associations to produce their own bees and queens. And I can tell you, I get around the country an awful lot, and it's surprising the number of people who buy things in. Um, uh, I've been the auctioneer at West Sussex, Sussex um, Auction for, I'm now being told it's over 30 years, and it's surprising the number of people who've got six or eight colonies, they lose one or two during the winter, and they come to the auction to buy another colony of bees. Something going wrong somewhere, either they're not learning or somebody's not teaching them. Why is this then? Well, it's in the title. Sustainability, bees, queens and everyone use no cost simple methods. That's the word sustainability. So we don't have to rely on anybody else or bringing stuff in from, uh, from outside. To produce and maintain good local stock, wherever that is, and I know some people come here, they probably come 100 miles to get here. You may well need slightly different bees than people do just out the back here. So they need to suit your locality and survive us as well.
how many people buy bees um, and they don't uh, survive the winter, so what do they do? They go and buy some more exactly the same. It's amazing. Hopefully to encourage local beekeeping associations to provide bees with the gifts. And I'm on your way at the front end. I'm on your way? I can't see it. Well, it's not worth seeing anyway. <laughs> you, 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 you look amazing. <laughs> so it's to avoid uh, buying. Because you, it's surprising how much you can propagate uh, bees and queens. Obviously without using imports. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So, sustainable beekeeping without imports, and is it possible? Well, let's take a look at history. Uh, for 10,000 years, we survived without imports. Um, and, um, uh, and until the middle of um, the 19th century, um, there are three places that I know uh, of quite well, Orkney, the Isle of Man, and Colonsey. All of those have got, had a close population for around about 25 years or more. So, yes, there's absolutely no argument. We can survive. If you think about it, we may well have to soon um, in, in case imports are uh, banned. So we, we, we might be without imports. So what we're really doing is propagating. Bees and queens, and the two of them will go together. You can't propagate bees without the queen to go with them. So they, they, they've got to go together. The bees actually give us lots of opportunities during the summer uh, to improve our bees as well. Because all the time we're re re replacing queens, um, we, we can look for something a bit better. But we do need to understand what's happening. And I'm afraid there's going to be quite a lot of explanation here um, because I guess we've got, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we've got quite a wide um, a diversity of abilities and knowledge in the audience and I've got to explain it obviously for the new ones coming in. So there's going to be quite a bit of explanation. But I have to be honest, those of you who've heard or seen any of my lectures before, there's going to be some repetition because some of the slides I'm using here and some of the points I'm using here are used in various other presentations. I can tell you some of it won't be found in books. So, um, <coughs> And some of it may well be frowned upon by, by uh, uh, some of the higher-ups. Not that there's too many of them, but you know, you know it's like in beekeeping. Um, over 50 some odd years of, of keeping bees, you actually find out ways of doing things, or you see, um, see other people doing things, and they're never in books. That doesn't mean to say they're wrong, and it doesn't mean to say they should be discredited. Um, so perhaps if you're doing your examinations, um, uh, perhaps don't. Um, write down the, uh, the, the methods that I'm telling you, uh, unless of course you, um, uh, you tell them the source you got it from, in which case you're bound to fail. <laughs> I'm going to give a few examples uh, during the day. They're all absolutely genuine, but I'm going to try not to identify anyone or a, a beekeeping association. I'm really just um, using them as, um, as sort, of, sort of examples. Now what I'll tell you today is uh, my opinion, not necessarily bibbers, I haven't passed anything by uh, bibber at all. But I'm going to be aiming at all beekeepers, so I'm going to try and satisfy all of you because as I've already said there must be a wide experience and knowledge range. Um, we've got beekeepers here, we've got beekeeping uh, association officials and we've also got teachers as well. You've had enough already? <laughs> Good. She didn't pay. Um, so please listen to it all because I think it's going to be much relevant for everybody but I haven't got any time to go into any great detail so don't think you're going to learn very much about a particular system uh, today. Uh, that will be covered by other events either by Beba or your local associations wherever you come from. So who's out there then? How many of you got no bees yet? <sighs> Hope I don't put you off by the end of the day. Less than five years been keeping bees. Count and Bob, got it? Yeah. Been keeping bees between five and ten years. Are you counting Carl? Yep. Good stuff. Over ten years. Getting less, isn't it? Getting less. <coughs> Who's got five colonies or less? You can put your hand up once, Jeff. No, I thought... 
Aye. Who's got between six and twenty colonies? That's quite a sizable number, yeah, okay. Between twenty-one and fifty. So, and over fifty. Right, we've still got some, so I guess you'll probably consider yourself a bee farmers. <coughs> right, how many of you are teachers, demonstrators, speakers, to beekeepers, I mean? Do things locally. Right. How many of you are beekeeping association officials or committee? Hands seem to be going up slower then, don't they? <laughs> yeah. How many HR managers? Good, I'm on your side. Let's look at HR managers first. Personally, I think um, uh, they're a very important part of the uh, beekeeping association. Uh, yes, you need your um, secretaries, you need your treasurers, you need your chairman or whatever, but you need somebody, in my opinion, who's going to um, operate the the main teaching facility of most associations um, uh, well. So please, please, please support them. Uh, don't keep turning up to meetings late, going early, and then moan like hell when you get home. To the best of my knowledge, um, bees were first imported into the United States in 1622. In 1640, the town of Newbury in Massachusetts set up a municipal um, community apiary. Now I don't know much about it, um, but it was a pretty, um, a pretty forward-thinking thing to do. Um, I copy, or quote rather, a combination education experimental station and welfare program. They even put somebody in charge of it, a man called John Neal. So all this is recorded. There's one very slight problem. John Neal became the town's first pauper. <laughs> Right, so, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually an uh, apron manager as well, so I thought you'd like a bit of fun. But about my beekeeping, I've been keeping bees since 1963. At one stage I had about 130 colonies and using bees as part of my living, although I was um, uh, working full time at the same time. Uh, and had three children and played cricket twice a week, but we, 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 won't, we won't go into that. I've always produced bees, queens, and honey throughout my beekeeping uh, life, even from the very uh, early stages. I've been demonstrating since the early 1970s, and currently, um, f since 2013, I've given over 60 presentations a year, plus the local um, uh, association. In fact, I gave one Friday night, and I think there's somebody here who was, um, who was there. A lot of mine are all day, so I get around, I see a lot of beekeepers. I'm a pre manager with the Greens, I told you. I'm a practical beekeeper. Not too much scientific about me. Um, so I understand your needs, whether, without being disrespectful, where the ordinary beekeeper keeper is, is coming from. And that's a majority, as we found out earlier. So I'm speaking to you from experience, what the bees have told me, not just read a book and then just stand up in front of an audience. Um, in that time, of course, I've used um, uh, an awful lot of methods. Try this, try that, try something else. I've used and handled lots of different kinds of bees in different kinds of hives, too. I've travelled uh, widely, mainly in the UK and Ireland, where, of course, I handle a lot of bees, speak to a lot of beekeepers, folks like you, uh, lunchtimes, after the event, all the rest of it, seen a lot of beekeeping associations. Um, a lot of teaching facilities too, a lot of um, uh, uh, apiaries, so I've heard a lot of speakers, teachers, demonstrators, um, lots of different theories and advice, but I've always listened, always, uh, and I think that's the important thing to do. I've formed the opinion that you definitely can't judge a beekeeper by the length of time they've been beekeeping, because I can tell you there's some really good potential beekeepers been keeping bees a year or two, and some absolute hopeless ones that have been keeping bees 20, 30, or even sometimes 40 years. I'm not talking about anyone in particular. <laughs> you can't tell them what the number of colonies they own or manage either, because somebody's got two or three colonies, very often it's as sharp as somebody who's got a hundred. And you definitely can't tell by, the, by, by their qualifications either. 
like everything else, there's some good ones and there's some rather uh, uh, poor ones. So what are we looking at? Why are we here? Well here's the official um, EU uh, figures for Queens imported uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the EU. Now they're not exactly uh, exact figures because they're ones that apparently are booked in. But just have a look, see what's happened in eight years. It's gone from four and a half thousand to four times the amount imported. But how many are imported illegally? Somebody just gets online, orders something from, I don't know, Romania or somewhere like that, or Greece, or, or, or whatever, and it just bypasses the system. In 2018, how many queens were imported from Argentina? Anyone know? 525. How many of the samples were examined? The, the, the samples were supposed to be examined. One of them was. That sample had no zima and varroa. Excuse me, yes? Yeah, we did check all the ones that came to one supplier from Argentina. The yeah, oh, sorry, Bob, can you. Can you take the mic down there, please? Sorry. <laughs> we did check all 500 queens that went to one supply from Argentina. Every one of them? Yes. Right, okay. Right, no, now answer that. You've answered that, now answer this. Carry on. Yeah, I'm waiting. Right. That sample had nosema and it had Varroa. Right, now. Okay, we've got nosema, we've got Varroa. But we've now got two kinds of nosema. Nosema serrani, the worst one, probably came in on bees. So, as a result of importation, don't worry, Sandra, I'm not getting at the MBU, um, I support them, don't worry about that. Um, right, now Varroa. Now, I'm an engineer, not a biologist, but if the Varroa were um, resistant to a, uh, a treatment that we haven't got, could it be that we could get a, um, a little population of varroa that are resistant to that particular product so that means that we can't use it in the future? I don't know. I hope somebody's um, uh, worked that one out. It's exactly the same figure as in 2017. Or well, according to the website it is. But I ask the question, what long-term benefit, long-term benefit, uh, are queens from Argentina? I don't know, can anyone tell me? Hang on a minute, Argentina. How many of you folk know that they've got Africanized bees in Argentina? Nothing to do with disease. I'll leave it there, leave that one there. So why do we have imports? The reasons often given are increased genetic diversity, um, you get queens early in the season, uh, negative comments about what's already here, so we need something better. Uh, commercial interests, quite a big uh, uh, thing that is. They're more prolific. Got to have big colonies, got to have big colonies. We'll talk about that later. Make up for winter losses. Why do we have winter losses? But let's, let's, let's um, talk about that later. Higher yields. All these, on paper, are fairly logical points, but I think some of them are actually false logic, so we're going to look at them later. Other reasons, grass is greener. There's a hill over there, and the bees the other side are better than what we got. Let's try them. We've been doing that for 170 years or whatever. Selfishness, I'm afraid. I'm going to have a lot, I'm not going to be told. I'm going to take in notes to anybody else, so I'm going to keep bringing them in every year. Just get online and see how arrogant some of the comments are about um, uh, by people who import uh, queens. Just do it. Let's just look at increased genetic diversity because that one keeps coming up even from ordinary beekeepers. So do individuals really import queens for that reason? I don't think any of you folk are going to. Is the hand got on the back there? We've got around about a quarter of a million managed colonies in England and Wales, plus a feral, so let's say 300,000 uh, as a, probably a bare minimum. It's unlikely um, that um, uh, queens coming in are going to increase genetic diversity. 
So what are the objections then? Possibly less sensitive conditions, possibly introducing uh, pests and disease pathogens we haven't got, possibly aggressive in later generations. And we talk about most of these a bit later. Notice I put possibly there because they may not. Some might, uh, some might not. So I'm not accusing them of actually doing anything. DEFRA conducted a queen replacement survey um, and uh, they, um, uh, they surveyed um, ordinary beekeepers. <laughs> they asked 26 questions. Personally, I think some of them were poorly worded and I think people have actually given the wrong answer as a result of it, but let's not worry too much about that. They had 4,763 uh, responses. But I think they're quite unreliable because in two instances there were only 200, just over 200 answered, so four and a half thousand skipped the question. So I really don't think you can take too much notice of um, uh, a small sample like that. However, they did raise some uh, really good points um, and we'll be discussing some of those later. Um, and now I've selected a few questions, it might be relevant to some of you folk here. Question 11 was, why did you purchase queens instead of rearing them yourself? I do not have experience to raise my own queens, 41%. Well, that might be for a number of reasons, including perhaps I asked people who only just come in, um, into beekeeping. I do not have the time needed to raise queens, 16%. Um, a percent. Um, both of those, I think, for the vast majority of uh, beekeepers, they're actually doing a lot of it anyway, so I really don't see why they answered like that. Need the queens early in the season, 12%. Bought in queens are more cost effective. How they quite work that out, I don't know, but 7%, I assume it might be uh, commercial beekeepers. To improve the temperament of the colony, so they admit that they've got a problem with their bees, 35%. And to improve productivity, uh, 23%. Um, all of those I think we will be covering uh, later. So what form of assistance would help you to increase the number of queens uh, you rear in future? Mentoring, I assume they mean one to one but I don't really know, 28%. Training courses of which you could probably classify this as one and hands on um, uh, 47%. So people are perhaps looking at producing their own queens but don't know quite how to. Would you be inter interested in attending a course that would help you improve your queen rearing skills? 59-60% uh, said yes, 22% said no. Now is that people who just aren't the slightest bit interested or perhaps people who know how to do it? I don't know. And the don't know unsure was 18%. Are you part of a bee breeding improvement program? 95% said no. Well, I think um, by the end of the day we can work out that perhaps local beekeeping associations can help um, uh, people produce uh, decent queens. So hopefully we can get that figure down. Do you think the mix of native, native and imported honey strains is positive? Only 12%, which I, I, I think is, is a lot lower than I, I expected. Negative effect, 45%, um, so nearly half. And the don't knows and unsure, it's only a shade less than that. Uh, and that I think is a sort of worrying trend that perhaps um, we can address. Would you be in favour of a national breeding uh, a program for England based on the native, near native subspecies, subspecies Apis mellifera mellifera. Right, yes, 80%, no, 9%, don't know, 12%. And no disrespect to the ordinary beekeeper, but I'd be surprised if many in this room um, have actually had experience of um, handling pure Apis mellifera mellifera. Has anybody? Any of you? One? That's why I think we've got to treat these figures with a little bit of caution. But they're asking the right questions, I think. So they're all good points. Um, we need to address them somehow, not just in this room, but beekeeping generally. 
Beekeepers need to learn, but how? We're all involved. On one hand, we're all individuals, but we're all part of the National Beekeeping Association. We're all presumably part of the local beekeeping association. So perhaps there ought to be something that brings everybody together so that um, uh, we end up with hopefully better bees in this country. Let's go for it. Here's a few thoughts, some you might disagree with. I do get around an awful lot, and I think I can tell you that overall the beekeeping standards uh, in this country and the advice given overall are quite uh, poor. There are some very, very good ones, um, uh, and that's individual beekeepers and teachers, but it, it's a bit depressing some of the places I go and people who probably been keeping bees 20 years, don't even know the life cycles. It's, it, it really is uh, depressing. Um, here's one that'll amuse you. Um, a beekeeper, um, been keeping bees 40 years, got a dozen colonies, supplies three shops. He's a, a, a sheep farmer and he, um, he's always got honey, but when I inspected his colonies, which he looks at regularly, I showed him the first queen he'd ever seen in his hive. First queen. It, it amazed me. And he wasn't joking, he won't pull in the leg at all. Um, anybody of you ever, ever been to Gormanston in Ireland, the Irish Summer School? Yeah, good stuff, Irish Summer School. If you can get, get a week off, go. Um, I gave a lecture out there three or four years ago, and um, I forget what it was, um, and uh, I was sitting down that time, and the man came and chatted to me, and said he'd, he'd, he'd been to the lecture, he enjoyed it, and all the rest of it, started talking, and uh, he, uh, he revealed that his queen excluders he actually nailed down to the top of the brood chamber. So, even though I was born and brought up in Sussex, I started thinking, you know, how are you going to get in the brood chamber? So I asked him a question. He said, oh, so no, I said, um, well, why did you nail them down? Oh, he said, well, I lift the supers off. He said, the queen excluders didn't peel off with the supers. So I said, well, how do you look in, inside your brood chamber? What on earth do I want to do that for? He said. <laughs> And you know that's that's he he, he wasn't Irish. I'll, 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 I'll better make that point first. Uh, but that's the sort of thing. So those two that I've, uh, I, I knew about. This one I don't actually know about, but I'm very reliably informed that right at the moment there's a beginners course um, that's being advertised by a local beekeeping association for seventy-five pound, and apparently the tutor started beekeeping last year. Sorry folks, but you know, this is the sort of stuff that's out there. Right, I can tell you we aren't alone because I've been to um, uh, several other countries um, and in the States, the United States in particular, um, I was amazed how little some beekeepers, they've been, been keeping bees 10, 15, 20 years, uh, how little they, they, they knew. And I could tell you a story about a state bee inspector too. So, a few more thoughts. Personally, I think we need a culture change from what we've got. Um, I think beginners are incredibly important. I really do. And it's in the very first year, the first year or two, that I think it's important for um, uh, uh, beekeepers learning. So is the rest. So they shouldn't be abandoned. Beekeepers shouldn't be abandoned uh, after that. <coughs> in my book, beekeepers need to have um, a certain number of um, uh, abilities. Uh, the powers of observation, because um, you need to see what's happening in the colony, something that's perhaps, perhaps wrong. You also need to know what's going right too. Um, you very, very definitely need lateral thinking. What's going to happen in this colony in an hour, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, next week, three weeks time. you really got to work out what's going to happen. And um, some are very good at it, others I'm afraid aren't, and of course common sense, which we all know about from the workplace. It ain't as common as it used to be. I always encourage beekeepers to challenge what they're told. Even what I'm telling you, challenge it. Think to yourself, well, does that add up from the knowledge that you've got? Um, try and work out if what you're told is correct, rather than uh, somebody tells you, oh, they must be a good beekeeper because uh, this, that, or the other. I'll go and do that. Work, go, go, go home and see if it, if it works. Try and work it through and see if it um, actually works. 
You can also do simple experiments. And um, if, you, if you do that, you very often find that some of the stuff you're told isn't always correct. And a, 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 the example that I uh, give as often as I can is we all get in a situation where you take a queen away from a colony. <coughs> Go to that colony every, uh, every day for three weeks, uh, roughly the same time each day, and it is surprising what you'll learn. Surprising. One of the things is um, uh, the, uh, the, the age of larva. So let's say if you go in five days after you took the queen away, the smallest larva, that's what a, a five day old larva looks like. Seven days, all sorts of things like that. You can do simple little experiments yourself. Even more thoughts. I think we need to provide good, sound information. Somehow we've got to negate um, the poor information, uh, this out there, the sort of stuff that just keeps um, uh, being recycled, that the more experienced beekeepers know isn't always correct. And please, please, please think locally. Even in Kent, I suspect beekeeping down in Dover is probably different than up in somewhere like Bromley. Um, you know, you, you've got to think, uh, 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 think locally. This, of course, is one of the problems with um, things like BBK News, um, websites, and all sorts of things like that. People write as if everybody's bees are the same as theirs. And uh, you know, some places I go the in, in the country, and um, uh, one in particular in North Wales, beekeeper's got um, a small hole in there, and he can't keep more than four to six colonies in his back garden, or you know, on, his, um, on his small holding really. Um, and that's because the area is very, very marginally f marginal for bees. If he takes those bees 15 miles away to what, he call, what they call the, the Wrexham Plain, they do brilliantly. They're totally different colonies. So even that, um, uh, that short distance apart, bees, uh, bees are different. And um, that it's only when you get the benefit of going around and seeing uh, different uh, bees in different places that you understand these. And we need to think about bees. So all the politics that we get in beekeeping, please cut it out, it's the bees, insects that long, they're the ones that are, um, are important. Not somebody in their stupid politics because somebody built up a little uh, uh, empire that they don't want anyone to get anywhere near. I won't look at you because all your faces are mouths are curling up because you know what I mean. So I'm favouring Education, demonstrate, and persuade. No, you've got to do this one. You've got to do that way, you've got to do some other way. Because I think they're much, uh, much more powerful tools than uh, force are. But you can only do it from a position of, position of experience and knowledge, which you can all get. <laughs> the more you're in beekeeping, the more you look at the, bee look at the bees, understand what's happening inside a colony, the more you learn. So how can we do it then? Beekeepers do learn in different ways. We've got to try and work with them. Um, we can't just assume that everyone will learn in the same way. Uh, some will learn by books, some will learn off the screen, uh, some will work it out themselves. We need the good sound information, which is where the beekeeping associations come in. They can do it and put information on uh, websites, Certainly at Whisper Green, my association, uh, we've got quite a lot on the, on the website that people can refer to. They don't always do it, but they do. <laughs> if you get a lecturer or um, run a course or whatever, or demonstrations, make sure who's ever running it or is helping um, are actually up to it, not, not just a, uh, a, a beginner. And teaching apries, I think, are a major, um, major help to, uh, to learning. So, beginners especially, views and habits um, are formed very, very early. And it's sometimes very, very difficult uh, to change uh, later because they seem to get this idea in their mind that the, the, their first teacher that taught the tutor or whatever, um, they're right and everybody else is um, uh, not quite so right. They're all given a standard fare in the um, 
uh, in the beginner's classes, aren't they? They're all taught the top of beast suit, they have their extracting equipment, diseases and something like that. And they've got it major most of them, but they, 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 they pump this stuff out. How many of them are actually taught very simple queen mirroring, perhaps how to uh, increase um, uh, their, um, uh, their colonies? Um, oh, I think I've already mentioned the, the, the option. Um, you know, beekeepers, five, ten years' experience, just come and, if they lose a colony, they go and buy another one. And colony assessment, too. Assessing your colonies, seeing which ones are perhaps the better ones to breed from. So let, let's change all that um, uh, sort of culture. Local beekeeping associations are where most of the learning is done. So that, I think, is where we've got to concentrate. Some I come across are very, very good. Um, in general, if they've got a, a, a teaching apron, a good sound um, uh, a demonstrators, their, their, their members are usually very, very good. Some, I'm afraid, are less so, but um, I won't criticise them because they're, they're all volunteers. Some, I have to say, are doing an incredibly good job. The, you, you get pockets of really good uh, beekeepers around the country. Sadly, there are too many simply teaching from books, and um, that, I think, um, is a bit silly. Why have a meeting when somebody can just read it online or go to the library? <laughs> in some cases, we've got beginners teaching beginners, and it's surprising the number of beekeeping associations where this year's beginners teach next year's beginners. Sorry, folks. Um, uh, that hasn't got much of a future, I don't think. Some of them, surprisingly, don't teach past uh, the first year. I came across um, a couple of people this, this last year where they'd done their, 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 their first year, asked what they should do the second year, and they were told to go and read a book or have a look online. <laughs> There's much more to beekeeping than that. Much more. So, sorry beekeeping associations, you people that put your hand up, I don't want you to go resign it, but I... I'm probably going to put quite a bit of pressure on you because although you individually might not um, uh, might not be involved with teaching, support those that, that, that want to or can. So I'm involved too because I've been involved with my local association. I've been on the committee now over 50 years and I've been involved in various other things as well. So I'm involved, so um, uh, I'll put pressure on myself, I don't mind. So that's the bones. Um, uh, of it, now perhaps a little bit of meat. But I'm very, very definitely not here to tell you folk what to do. I just don't operate like that, and I don't think it, it, anyone uh, should at all. If I can make some suggestions by the end of the day and give you ideas, and you can, um, uh, and you can uh, go home and uh, think about it, then that's absolutely fine. Some of what I'll say may well conflict with convention, that's entirely up to uh, you, whether you believe what I tell you or what, um, what somebody uh, else has told you. And I'm not the sort of character to rubbish anybody else's ideas or methods. Um, I don't see any point in that. Um, people do different things for different reasons, for different situations and all sorts of things like that. And uh, it may well suit what they're doing. It's not for me or anybody else to knock those, um, knock those unless of course they're not looking after bees properly and caring for them. And I'm going to try not to undermine your teachers uh, too. But there may well be some things later on that um, you might, or your teacher might disagree with. So for the day, please, um, I want you to try and remove any mental barriers you might have that uh, uh, the beast might do this or do that or something else. So uh, lay aside what you've been told, please. I'll ask you to bring it back at the end of the day. Please, please, please just have an open mind to something that's different, perhaps something that's certain you, perhaps something you're not used to. You see if what I say suits you. If not, modify either what you're doing or what I'm uh, telling you, or completely reject it. I really don't mind. Um, as long as you've listened, that's fine. But I hope you're going to be nice and positive and think, yes, I can do that. And there are some things I'm going to ask you to do, like culling queens, and when I mean cull, I mean cull, not just put in a little box just in case. If there's something wrong with a queen, just get her out of it. And plan for the coming season. 
do it locally, do it in your own sort of uh, groups because you're own, you know your own uh, situation. Uh, I know we've got some people here from Hampshire and I know they've got different types of bees down in Hampshire that probably some, uh, some of you, you, you folk have. Some of, uh, some of that's historical from teachers that have been in the past but they've got to do things perhaps a little bit differently than, uh, than, uh, than somebody else has. Now, beekeeping systems, <clears throat> every one of you has got one, even those that haven't got bees yet. You've got a system because you've probably done a bit of reading, done a bit of uh, uh, learning, and you think how you're going to keep your bees when you, when you get them. Um, even though you may have exactly the same teacher, all of you, they're all going to be different because it's going to suit um, uh, whatever your situation is. Um, could be circumstances, time available, um, your ability, knowledge, interest in beekeeping, number of colonies you've got, number of opinions you've heard, uh, and confusion too, because there's an awful lot of confusion in beekeeping. I've absolutely no idea where it comes from. Just don't know. <coughs> I purchased this off the internet because so I thought it summed up beekeeping brilliantly, because there are many ways of getting from here uh, to here. What you've got to do is pick whatever suits your system that you've worked out the way you want to keep your bees. And my system is based on simple management techniques. I use non-prolific bees so I can run mine on single brood chamber, British standard frames, um, nationals I use now, it used to be WBCs, cottages and all sorts of things, summer and winter summer and winter and I mean normal brood deaths not these great big long things that some people use I use castellated spaces in the brood boxes <laughs> <laughs> see what I mean <laughs> prejudice prejudice he's never used them <laughs> um, queen rearing and bee improvement are part of my beekeeping not a special effort. Uh, Sandra, Sandra, move away from me, you'll get corrupted. Okay. <laughs> um, and I'm pleased to say I've never worn a bee suit in my life, not even trying to get one on. Right. How many of you folk do any of those things? Probably few, I suggest. Why not? Why not? They fit my system, they work for me, why shouldn't they work for you? It's because you've got a slightly wide, different way of doing things, it don't fit. So that's okay. I'm not going to criticise you, but please, please, please don't criticise me. Although I have been heavily criticised, I've certainly been criticised for having uh, castellated spaces, but I found out a way of using them. I was criticised at the National Honey Show not so long ago for never wearing a bee suit because it gives a bad impression to beginners. What a load of twaddle. Sorry, but twaddle. Right, but I have the answer. I've got the answer. My own bees. I've not used imported queens for well over 50 years. Something like 53 years, something like that. All I've done is just select it from local stock. Whatever there is there with the characteristics that I want. I term them their native. And my system has evolved to suit my bees uh, and, my, and my district and, of course, um, my own uh, situation. So I put something together which works in my area. Might not work in yours, might not work in Cheshire, might not work in the Isle of Man. But that's what suits me. But here's the answer. Here's the amount of sugar I've fed to my bees in the last three um, uh, autumns. 2006 I averaged a kilo of colony, 2017 2 kilos and less than 2 kilos last year. How many of you folk did the same? During the last, uh, what, two and a half winters, 2016-17 I lost three colonies out of 25. All three were queen problems, you know, drone layers or whatever. 2017 the same but this time only one lost. This year I've lost one colony for 25 due to starvation in uh, November, which I'll tell you about a little bit later on. 
Yes, I've lost the comedy through starvation. Carelessness, you could say, but I'll give you the reasons why uh, later. So, spring 2017, I did what? 2017, 2018, no feeding apart from just moving cones between uh, colonies. So those that have got plenty, take a frame or two away and give those that will be short. <coughs> now, talk about um, assessment a little bit later on. Those that I, I had to feed with uh, food from other ones, they were the ones that were fairly early for being requeened. They're just, sorry, but if they're going to run out of food, eat too much, I don't want them. Same as children. <laughs> now in both years, both the last two summers, I've averaged just over £100 of honey per colony, and that's in an area that's midland for, um, uh, uh, for, for forage. Um, it really isn't very good. So I think that's, uh, that's pretty good. Um, I think you can say it's successful and um, sustainable as well because I've had no, um, no need to bring in stuff from outside. Two of our members, uh, one I'll call John because that's his name. Um, last year, he's only got one colony, he took 162 banana honey from it. He left one super high, so he didn't have to do any feeding. Yeah, we're nearly there now. Yeah. <coughs> Susie, and that's her name as well, 2017. Now Susie's a, a, a granny, I think she's got 11 grandchildren. And uh, she, she's very busy, she plays about three games of golf a week and all the rest of it. And uh, in 2017 she took 675 banner honey from seven colonies. So she thought to herself, I don't really want enough grandchildren to eat all that honey, so reduce the number of colonies. The following year, she put down to four, and uh, she took 620 pound of honey. Now, I don't know what she fed, uh, she did tell me in litres, but I, it depends on the strength of it, so I, I, I didn't um, muddle the figures up. All of those on single brood, and how many times do you hear you cannot keep bees on, the, on single brood, Jane, they're not big enough. All with home red queens, all of them. You folk can do the same. You don't have to go out buying this, buying that, you don't need double brood chambers if you well, not if you're in my area, you don't, anyway. But it just goes to show that some of the stuff you're told isn't always uh, uh, correct. Why? Because bees differ greatly. All the standard advice assumes they're all the same. Bees do this, bees do that, bees do something else. The queen lays 38, um, uh, say it's next a day or whatever. It's a sort of one size fits all. Um, uh, uh, mentality that I call beekeeping by numbers. Hang on a minute, Bob. You were ten minutes late starting. I've got, <laughs> I've got ten to, minutes to go yet. I'm trying to catch up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, uh, beekeeping by numbers. We're actually dealing with biology, folks, um, and um, we're. Um, uh, it's very variable, as I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a bit later on. Some of the things that vary considerably from what, what we're told. So you often need um, different management techniques, um, but of course the books on the screen, they don't tell you that. They just tell you this, 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 and this, and they don't perhaps tell you why. So the standard information then, must have large colonies. You've got to have a big um, uh, a foraging force. Bees need X amount of kilos um, of food for, for winter. Always leave two queen cells. I'll talk about that later. If you leave the queen cells, you've got to leave two. All the local bees chase you up the garden path. You've got to requeen regularly every year or two. Mollycoddle the bees. Do all sorts of things just to keep, keep, them, uh, keep them alive. Single brood chamber, or boxes too small. And of course the feed, feed, feed mentality, which I think has only come into beekeeping in the last 15 years or so. Before that, it wasn't, you know, you looked at the colony, see what you wanted, rather than just put feed on whether they needed it or not. Right, so why do these perpetuate then? I think it's an experience. Um, and uh, a lot of this stuff has been made worse in the last 15 years or so as we've got newer beekeepers coming. Of course, it all gets cut and pasted. And there's a little alternative talk. 
because if anyone knows anything different, they just let people get on with it, rather than come out and say, hang on folks, look, this isn't quite right, um, what about so and so? We need to let the bees tell us. You learn far more from bees than you will from somebody with two legs standing up in front of you. Now, teaching eight breed, personally, I think they're a great asset, massive asset. We've had ours at Whisper Green now over 50 years. You learn far more when you get your head stuck into a colony of bees than you will by reading any books. Far, far more. It does need to be well managed um, so you can keep the interest of the, um, uh, of the uh, members. So give them good sound useful information with experienced demonstrators if you possibly can. Please, please, please don't just give, um, don't think, oh, the, the, the beginners don't matter, they're only beginners, and give them your worst demonstrators. They're the, they're the ones that need the good demonstrators, so they can pull them up if something, um, if something needs doing, or perhaps point things out that the poorer demonstrator won't even see in the first place. So the management techniques you can uh, teach, a colony assessment, queen bearing, um, a colony increase, you can provide bees and queens for your members too, and I'll explain that um, at about, probably about 20 past nine tonight. Um, include them in your teaching. Include them. Here's one a very good uh, teaching apiary I demonstrated that. They've got plenty of room there. Um, I'm not deliberately criticising them, but I think they could probably make slightly better use of it. Um, what you could do is perhaps have a queen rearing section at one end of it, if they spread things out a little bit differently. Um, but that's what they had, that's fine. But if, you, if you're lucky enough to have that, a teaching apiary like that with a couple of sheds, um, that car park, that's a lot. This is another one in an old wall garden. Similar sort of situation. Now in, in this case, um, they had some absolutely brilliant bees there in an area where um, the surrounding bees are, let's say, quite ordinary. Uh, this guy had been keeping bees, I think, 60 years. He was the apron manager. He was, he was well into his 80s. And uh, he had some really good bees there. This one here, it was in a two acre field, right up in the corner. Now, they, they can't do very much there. They had plenty of space, they could have moved out. Why they didn't, I don't know. But it, um, uh, it, it could have been expanded, but there's a lot of restriction with something like that. I think they said they could only have six people at a time. Well, it was quite a big association. This is ours at Whisper Green, uh, teaching April at Whisper Green. Is that, um, is that sharp enough? Yeah, that's not very sharp, Bob, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's not very sharp up there, I don't think. Can you focus that up a bit, please? Um, right, yeah, so we've got high spread out quite a bit. They're the people waiting for to get put into groups. Yeah, okay. Sorry about that, folks. Right. What do we need to um, teach and learn then? What I call the basics. The simple sort of stuff that all beekeepers need. Um, but relevant to today's topic, life cycles, surprising the number of people who don't know them. The swarming process too, what actually is happening in the colony um, when it's preparing to swarm and when it does swarm. And again, I've come across beekeepers, 20 years experience, do not know. You will do, I'm sure. You need to uh, be able to recognise healthy bees and brood uh, as well and uh, if there's something wrong with it, find out what it is. Disease recognition. <laughs> we've got four notifiable pests and diseases, two of them we've got at the moment um, and have had for uh, uh, an awful long time. Um, both of our broods, you need to be able to uh, recognise those and I don't know what the figures are at the moment. Um, but it used to be the 80% of fowl brood was discovered by the bee inspectors on their in inspections. That, I think, is appalling, quite frankly. Um, we should be teaching them um, uh, a, lot, um, uh, uh, a lot more than that. Right. While we're doing it, um, and it's simple, when every time you go into a colony, 
the first frame with brood in all stages, on sealed and unsealed, to shake most of the bees off. Have a look quite closely at it um, at every inspection. Don't just do it as some are advocating first inspection and the last inspection in the year, because I can tell you, fail brood can come up in, in between very, very quickly. So just check it. That's all you need to do. And it should be a habit, just like not, not in your smoker or, um, uh, or taking a roof off a hive. Now, I'm getting close to the end there, Bob. Um, I've got to tell you about the queen problems that we've had probably for approaching uh, 20 years, because it is relevant. Those people who put their hands up and said they've been keeping bees over 20 years will know what I mean. Those that um, are coming into beekeeping, there's this lot coming in, which is um, uh, a problem which we never used to have. So let's just look at what should happen in a natural colony with, with, with a queen. They should live perhaps three to five years and then um, superseded at the end of that. Perhaps they'll swarm between, or somewhat swarm at all, perhaps three times in, in, in their lives. So the queens actually have different homes. Any super